All right. Let me give everybody just a moment to get started, but I want to say welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we have a great webinar planned for you and very excited to cover this topic as well. Um, I know you guys are going to have lots of great questions. Um, I definitely encourage you to think of them. You can put those in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer them more towards the end of the webinar today. Um, but we have a lot of great things in store. And then I'm also gonna later introduce you to our wonderful partners at HMR and On Point Legal Nurse Consulting. Um, but anyway, I think everyone knows who I am. My name is Ginger. I am with um, the Executive Director of the Connectionology Seminars of America. And I'm very excited because not only are we still doing all of these great webinars, but we have a whole new month of webinars that I will be launching on our website in the next couple of days. So stay tuned for that. And then um, don't forget, we've got Nashville that's coming up April 30th through May 3rd, and it is going to be a wonderful traumatic brain injury seminar. It's three full days. They're almost 30 CLE credits. We got 30 speakers from all around the country. Um, we're going to do lots of great events, including um, a live TBI mock trial. We're going to be doing um, a fireside chat with all the speakers. We've got a great welcome reception. So definitely bring your cowboy boots, bring your hat. We're going to have a lot of fun. Um, now, it is my honor to go ahead and get started with this webinar. Um, I think most of you might already know Haley. but She is an incredible trial lawyer who works with John Romano at the Romano Law Group in West Palm Beach, Florida. And she actually handles a variety of wrongful death and personal injury matters, concentrating more of her practice on traumatic brain injury cases, as well as structural collapse cases including that as well. And she has such an amazing passion for supporting women in the legal profession. She's the founder and the co-chair of the National Trial Lawyers Women's Leadership Forum. She's also a committee chair for the Palm Beach County chapter of the Florida Association for Women's Lawyers. And then she also sits on the board of the Florida Justice Association's Women's Caucus. And she's a member of the Palm Beach County Justice Association's Women's Caucus as well. And I'm also so, so proud of Haley because she is the president of the National Trial Lawyers Top 40 Under 40, which is getting ready to kick off in the next week or so. They're doing an amazing seminar out in Denver, Colorado. So be sure to go to the National Trial Lawyers website to find out more information. But Haley, we are so proud of you. And I am so excited about this webinar today. Thank you so much, Ginger, and thank you for that kind introduction, and welcome to all of our attendees today. Um, today is going to be an absolutely incredible uh, webinar, so make sure you are paying attention and taking notes because you're definitely going to want to learn from Dr. Stein today. Um, so today you're going to be uh, hearing about beyond the obvious, overlooked injuries related to motor vehicle accidents. Um, and with us today, we have Connor Gammons from Physician Life Care Planning, which I will formally introduce in a minute. Um, but our main event today is with our lead speaker, Dr. Perry Stein. Um, he is a board certified physical medicine and rehabilitation, neuromuscular and electrodiagnostic medicine um, and hospital, hospice and palliative medicine specialist who has practiced medicine in the state of New York since 1987. Dr. Stein is a licensed physician in the states of New York, New Jersey, and Florida, and he is certified by the American Board of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and the American Board of Electrodiagnostic Medicine. He is also a certified life care planner as designated by the International Commission on Health Care Certification. Dr. Stein is the director of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Mercy Medical Center in Rockville Center, New York, and he is the president of the Parkway Pain Care and Rehabilitation. He has several professional associations, some of which include the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, as well as the American Academy of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine, and many, many others. Uh, Dr. Stein received his Doctor of Medicine from the Universidad del Norris. Day. Hopefully I'm saying that right in Mexico, and we are so excited to have him here with us today and learn from him um, today. So at this point, I'm going to pass over the webinar um, to Connor Gammons. Connor is the Business Development Associate 
for the Northeast for Physician Life Care Planning. Um, and Connor's going to help us get through today's webinar and also to facilitate any questions that any of our attendees have. Um, as we progress through today, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to put in um, your questions and Connor will either answer those directly or we will pass them on to the doctor at the end of today's webinar to get those answered for you. So with that, please stay engaged, please send us your questions and Connor, take it away. Thank you, Haley, for the introduction. Thank you, Ginger, and thank you everyone at Connectionology for allowing us to speak to you today. For those of you that don't know, Physician Life Care Planning is the nation's leading provider of damages valuation services, who specializes in the formulation of future medical requirements, loss of earnings capacity, and loss of household services. What makes us different is all of our life care planners, like Dr. Stein, are practicing medical doctors who are board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. That means they're uniquely qualified to provide and defend a strong medical foundation in life care planning based on their experience treating, providing rehabilitative services to individuals with disabilities. Today, our associate physician, Dr. Stein, is going to be speaking on the topic overlooked injuries in motor vehicle accidents. And Dr. Stein, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Connectionology. Thank you, Haley. Uh, thank you, uh, Ginger. Uh, thank you, Connor. Thank you to all the attendees. Um, I will share with you my PowerPoint presentation at this time, and we can get started. Okay, so uh, today's topic is overlooked injuries related to motor vehicle accidents. So um, a little bit about me. I have been uh, the chair of physical medicine and rehabilitation at uh, Catholic Health Mercy Hospital for the past 20 years. Um, we have a 37 bed acute inpatient rehab unit here uh, that is dedicated to the rehabilitation treatment of patients who have suffered catastrophic illnesses and injuries. Um, the rest you already heard about, so I will move on. Um, so we're asking you to consider um, choosing a physiatrist uh, for your life care plans. And, and, and the reason that, that we bring this to your attention is that uh, we as physiatrists, are, uh, um, our training and experience uh, includes neurology, orthopedics, and obviously rehabilitation medicine. And it's the type of specialty uh, that gives us um, the, the skills to determine holistically uh, what the patient needs. Uh, and we'll get into these, uh, these items a little bit further uh, down the road. Um, we manage patients long-term and appreciate phase changes of structural injuries. And what that means is that um, as individuals with injuries age, um, their functional reserve declines, and, and that obviously has an impact um, on, their, uh, on the nature of the injuries that they have sustained and how those injuries impact them on a daily basis. Um, just a little background, physiatry, the definition, it comes from the Greek of physical and uh, the art of healing. Um, and that is um, how the, uh, the specialty of physiatry chose its name uh, because we use um, physical uh, modalities uh, as a big part of our practice uh, to help patients um, recover from their injuries and illnesses. Physical, uh, physical modalities date back to ancient times, but uh, they really um, came to the forefront um, during World War II and with the polio epidemic. Um, survivors of, uh, of injuries um, during World War II and, uh, and uh, polio survivors um, required the type of treatments that physical medicine and rehabilitation um, was uniquely uh, 
uh, uniquely placed uh, to address. Um, it has been a, a specialty recognized um, in the United States since 1947. And today there are over 11,000 board certified physiatrists nationwide. So what is physiatry and what is physiatry not? Uh, physiatrists are medical doctors um, with the full um, scope of practice uh, of all medical doctors, that is to diagnose and treat um, illnesses and injuries. Um, we are located throughout all of the United States. Uh, we typically uh, take care of patients both in the hospital as well as um, out of the hospital uh, in the outpatient setting. Um, and uh, we are integral members uh, of the care team from the, uh, from the beginning through the end. So that is to say, uh, when patients come into the acute care hospital with uh, catastrophic injuries, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, members of the team and we see the patients early on. Uh, we get an opportunity um, to, uh, to be involved in their care from the onset, through recovery, through discharge back to the community, hopefully. Uh, what we are not is we are not in competition with primary care physicians um, because we, uh, even when we do serve as primary care physicians, it is for those patients who have really had catastrophic illnesses and injuries um, and for whom uh, the complexity of their care is uh, above the scope of practice of a typical uh, primary care physician. Uh, we are not physical therapists, we are medical doctors, nor are we chiropractors or, as I am often referred to, a psychiatrist, um, although that would not have been a bad choice either, but, uh, but nevertheless, we are not psychiatrists. Um, typically, it's a four-year medical school, um, one year of, um, of a preliminary um, internship, whether that be internal medicine or surgery or a transitional year, followed by three years of training in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, some, um, some graduates of physical medicine and rehabilitation residency training programs do go on uh, to subspecialize and uh, do fellowships in various, uh, various subspecialty areas. And um, we'll learn a little bit more about that uh, later on in the presentation as a matter of fact, right now. So uh, some of the, the subspecialty or fellowship training that's available to physiatrists after they complete their three years of physical medicine and rehabilitation, uh, preceded by a year of either internal medicine surgery or a combination thereof, include hospice and palliative medicine, um, neuromuscular medicine, pain medicine, pediatric rehabilitation, spinal cord injury, sports medicine, and traumatic brain injury. And um, it's not uncommon for, uh, for patients uh, to be seen by um, more than one physiatrist who have different um, specializations. So just like a patient may be seen by um, a patient with a medical problem, may be seen by a primary care physician, as well as various subspecialties of internal medicine. Similarly, uh, patients who have had catastrophic illnesses and injuries uh, are, it's not uncommon for them to be under the care of a general physiatrist, as well as under the care of specialized physiatrists in one or more of these areas uh, of expertise. And uh, <clears throat> the guiding principle of our approach uh, to, uh, to the care of patients with catastrophic illnesses and injuries is um, to really approach function and quality of life. Um, those are the two biggest principles that we are always, uh, always uh, thinking about when we approach the patient uh, with injuries and illnesses and helping them uh, to recover. We're looking for optimum function, optimum quality of life. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, back in the day, uh, the byline of the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation was adding life to years. Um, we uh, typically, uh, provide care um, in an integrated fashion. Uh, that means uh, we use both pharmacological and non-pharmacological modalities. Uh, we try to, uh, to, to help our patients avoid surgery whenever possible. Um, and typically in the inpatient uh, rehab area, we uh, coordinate uh, an interdisciplinary team of, um, uh, of um, 
professionals that um, would include, for example, um, the rehab nurse, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, the psychologist, the neuropsychologist, um, the social worker. Um, so typically we have uh, interdisciplinary team meetings with all of the members uh, um, of the team on a regular basis to provide optimum care to the patient who is receiving um, acute inpatient rehabilitation. It's quite a unique setting, setting of care uh, for the treatment of patients with catastrophic illnesses and injuries. Um, the, uh, the residency training um, is unique in that we do take from various other disciplines um, and get formal training in, in these various other disciplines, including orthopedics, rheumatology, uh, neurology, um, both in the inpatient and in the outpatient setting. Um, electromyography was, uh, was actually um, started, the whole field of, uh, of electrodiagnostic medicine was actually started uh, by physiatrists. Um, so that's obviously in our wheelhouse, uh, one of the uh, foremost uh, diagnostic tools uh, to help us uh, diagnose uh, injuries and illnesses involving nerves and muscles, uh, as well as musculoskeletal ultrasound and advanced spinal and joint injections. Always uh, trying to um, optimize function uh, and uh, avoiding surgery whenever possible. So some of the conditions that we typically treat musculoskeletal conditions, um, including trauma, um, whether they be related to sports or work or repetitive use disorders, acute and chronic back pain, uh, diseases involving the musculoskeletal system, including osteoporosis and arthritis, and rehabilitation following joint reconstruction, amputations, just, just to name a few, just to kind of give you a, a smattering of, uh, of conditions that we typically see. Uh, cardiovascular conditions. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, prior to my uh, arrival at Mercy Hospital, I was a medical coordinator in, in charge of uh, cardiac rehabilitation at Kingsbrook Jewish Medical Center. Um, it is a, a very rewarding aspect of, uh, of physical medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, similarly for pulmonary and for others, uh, including um, cancer, uh, patients with a diagnosis of cancer, HIV, um, and uh, as well as pediatrics and geriatrics. So you can see that we really run the entire gamut in terms of our expertise um, in providing physical medicine and rehabilitation care uh, to patients from uh, the entire spectrum um, of uh, injuries and, and diseases. Um, from the neurologic perspective, we uh, often see patients with spinal cord injury, uh, whether they be traumatic or non-traumatic, um, brain injury, again, whether they be traumatic or non-traumatic, um, stroke, multiple sclerosis, uh, neuropathies, um, movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease, cervical dystonia, and others, and, um, and for uh, uh, really the most severe um, of uh, neurological diseases, perhaps uh, motor neuron disease, um, or as you might know it as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And these are some of the examples of how we um, approach uh, the care uh, of, uh, for patients with, uh, with these uh, catastrophic injuries. And again, always looking to uh, optimize uh, function, whether it be cognitive function for traumatic brain injury uh, and social function for, for Um, similarly, for arthritic conditions, uh, always looking to uh, optimize function, decrease pain, um, and, and optimize the individual's quality of life. And we, we bring all of these approaches with us into the discipline of life care planning. Uh, this is serving as kind of a background um, to, uh, to bring us up to, um, to the subject of life care planning. 
So um, we're going to speak about uh, motor vehicle uh, crashes um, specifically today, um, but many of the same principles um, apply to um, many other areas uh, that, uh, that we're involved with as life care planners. So some common types of accidents, um, and I'm sure, by the way, just uh, as a uh, um, as a preliminary, I'm well aware of the fact that the attorneys um, who are attending today um, are very familiar with uh, a lot of what um, I am speaking about, um, including um, the nature of the injuries, uh, the diagnoses associated with these injuries, um, and, um, and uh, typically how they're managed. Um, what I'm hoping to do is perhaps just give you just a little bit uh, more insight into, into our approach. So uh, for rear end collisions, we typically see um, uh, whiplash injuries, uh, side impact collisions, we might see lateral flexion injuries, um, rollovers, um, um, compression and distraction injuries, um, multiple vehicle uh, collision or uh, sometimes referred to as pileups. Um, you can see a combination, obviously, and similarly with head-on collisions. Um, this, uh, this slide also um, breaks down, to some extent, the types of motor vehicle crashes that typically occur. Uh, so 22% um, of accident-related insurance quotes are for motorists who struck another vehicle. I uh, need to move that out of the way. 22.2% um, um, were um, victims that were struck by another vehicle. Um, at 8% were in single car accidents, uh, perhaps by hitting inanimate, um, immovable objects, falling debris. Um, this was, uh, I actually just had a, a falling debris um, case. Uh, with um, much more substantial injuries than I would have anticipated, actually. Um, and of course, acts of nature that, uh, that can spell devastation for unsuspecting motorists. And the uh, common mechanisms of injury, as I alluded to uh, earlier, include uh, axial compression, uh, flexion or hyperflexion, extension or hyperextension. Uh, you can also have uh, hyperflexion, hyperextension injuries, um, rotational injuries, lateral flexion or hyperflexion to the lateral side, distraction, um, compression, as uh, mentioned above, as well as uh, penetrating injuries. And uh, on the right is a, a little bit of a schematic of, of how these, uh, what these injuries look like um, perhaps uh, on imaging studies, but in a schematic format. Um, spinal injuries, just like um, injuries to other parts uh, of the body and to other joints, um, can, uh, can be uh, classified as strains, sprains, fractures, dislocations, um, and or fracture dislocations which is a combination of a fracture and a dislocation. A dislocation um, is when uh, the components of a particular joint um, are no longer uh, congruous. Uh, they, are, they no longer oppose each other as they normally do. Um, strains uh, typically, uh, typically are characterized by tears, either um, macro or micro tears, um, of uh, tendons and other soft tissues. Um, sprains typically um, uh, char are characterized by more complete disruption um, of the soft tissue uh, around the joint. And uh, this can lead to secondary um, immediate complications. Uh, so for example, um, a lumbar sprain may include um, a herniated disc. Uh, it may include a sprain um, a disruption of the, of the ligaments that support uh, the spine, 
Uh, it may include uh, compression of, of an adjacent nerve root uh, as the result of the disruption of the, of the normal anatomy. And uh, so what does this look like um, you know, from, from the individual's perspective and what typically happens um, as the result of, uh, of a motor vehicle crash? So there's the pre-hospital management, EMS is involved. EMS um, typically uh, will um, be in communication with the emergency department um, and provide a handoff uh, and receive instructions uh, from uh, the medical director um, as to, how, as to uh, what management uh, should or can be initiated in the field. Um, the, um, the patient may get admitted to an acute care hospital uh, for uh, acute management of, the, of their injuries. Uh, this, they, they may receive rehabilitation while they are um, in the acute care hospital they may then be discharged to a rehabilitation facility of one kind or another, whether it's an acute inpatient rehab facility or whether it's a nursing facility that provides subacute rehabilitation. Um, and then typically uh, there's um, long-term follow-up when the individual is discharged back to the community. Um, and typically that is when uh, we are involved um, from, uh, from the life care planning perspective. Um, as you're aware, many different types of specialists uh, are involved in the care of these patients, uh, both in the hospital as well as post-hospitalization, including pain management, um, surgery, psychological care, et cetera. There are diagnostic studies that need to be um, considered and of course, treatment options uh, to be considered. Um, typically, in the uh, non-catastrophic um, care of pay, uh, uh, arena, there are um, uh, specialists involved, um, disciplines involved um, that may include a chiropractor and a primary care physician, um, physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians, physiatrists uh, are also um, um, very often um, and perhaps primarily involved uh, in the care of, uh, of non-catastrophic injuries. Um, orthopedists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, all um, typically involved um, in the care of these patients. Diagnostic studies include the basics like um, plain films, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, um, and then more advanced types of imaging studies as well as uh, electrodiagnostic studies, including EMG and nerve conduction studies. So what are some of the things that are typically missed uh, following a motor vehicle crash? Vertigo, uh, tinnitus, sleep disturbance, irritability, um, nerve root injuries, radiculopathy, muscle spasm, facet arthropathy. Um, and I think we'll get into these um, a little bit um, in a little bit more detail uh, further on in the presentation. Um, similarly, uh, you can sometimes have adjacent segment disease. Uh, so um, what we don't often appreciate or what is sometimes missed is that um, as the result of a motor vehicle crash, um, a patient may present with um, a limited um, or may what initially seem like a limited injury involving, let's say, uh, two segments, let's say the L4 and L5 segments, just, you know, randomly. Um, and that may involve uh, a, a herniated disc at the L4-5 uh, herniated disc. It may involve um, a nerve root injury. Uh, but what we, uh, we sometimes uh, neglect to take into consideration is the fact that when there is injury at one level of the spinal cord, of the spinal column, rather, um, there are undue forces that are translated to adjacent uh, segments um, of the spinal column. So this is something that, that has to be uh, considered, um, particularly if a patient undergoes um, spinal fusion. Um, it can also be caused by natural degenerative changes that occur 
in the spine due to aging. Um, so even not as the result of spinal fusion, uh, but rather as uh, the natural consequence of aging, um, as the result of trauma that may not have been recognized when the individual was initially injured, um, but lo and behold, years later, um, adjacent segments of the spine um, seem to be uh, disproportionately um, uh, injured as compared to non-adjacent segments. Um, the risk in, um, in the lumbar spine uh, following fusion uh, variably reported uh, between 2 and 14% per year, um, and in the cervical spine, um, approximately 3% per year. And the reoperation rate 10 years after cervical fusion, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is approximately 22%. Important considerations uh, to, uh, to, take it, to, to consider when developing a life care plan uh, for an individual who may have already had spinal fusion or who may, who may be looking at spinal fusion in the near future. Dr. Stein, I think we are going to take a quick break for uh, the sponsors to speak. Great. Absolutely, and I am so excited to introduce everybody to Mike over at HMR. He should be popping in soon. And then also I am going to have um, Ingrid with um, On Point Legal Nurse Consulting. She's gonna tell you guys a little bit more about what they do. So give me just a moment. And then Dr. Stein, is it okay that we close out of these slides just for a moment? Absolutely. All right. Let me go ahead and do that. By the way, I see lots of questions. Everybody's like, I'd love a copy of this PowerPoint. Um, so definitely send Connor an email and he will make sure that everybody gets a copy of this. Um, I put his email in the chat box and I will add that again one more time. So um, thank you so much. And I see some questions coming in as well. I will make sure that we get to those um, after the presentation, but keep them coming, you guys. Um, Mike, I see you are already there. I am so excited. Thank you for coming back today. And um, if you can, tell us a little bit more about what you guys do at HMR because you have an incredible team over there. Um, sure. So responsive and we're just happy that you're here. Well, Ginger, thank you for having us. Uh, HMR is proud to be a sponsor of Connectionology. Uh, I'm Mike Seeley. I'm the Southern Regional Sales Manager for HMR Servicing. We're a medical funding company. And what we kind of have to offer is uh, we offer three non-recourse financial services to attorneys. Uh, the first of those being traditional medical factoring. Uh, we have a network of, of medical providers nationwide that you can utilize in your practice um, to, to, for any number of, uh, you know, any number of specialties, surgeries, burns. We're very, uh, very good in the TBI field. So if you have a TBI, uh, do yourself a favor and pick up the phone and give us a call. Uh, you'd be happy that you did. Uh, we also offer traditional medical, um, I'm sorry, pre-settlement funding. Uh, pre-settlement funding is funds that can be used for everyday expenses, from paying the mortgage, car payments, to working with providers that maybe you can't work with in your local practice that won't work on a letter of protection. Um, so we can make payments directly to providers on a cash basis to, uh, to help out as well. Um, those funds can also be used to cover travel, extended nursing opportunities uh, that you may need for uh, different types of clients in your practice. Um, and the third type is very new to us is litigation funding. Uh, and these are used to cover case cost expenses. So if you need a expert witness to come in to uh, shore, up, shore up your case, uh, that's something that we can provide. These funds can also be used for life care planning, uh, maybe a 3D accident reconstruction, anything that's related to the uh, cost of the case, or the, uh, these are the items that we can step in and fund under this program. Uh, it's brand new for us. We're excited to offer it. All three of the products are at very, very uh, competitive rates. Um, so pick up the phone, give us a call, and give us a shot. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Mike. Um, we love HMR funding at the Romano Law Group. John Romano uses you guys all the time. Um, in our brain injury cases, HMR can be critical. So for anybody out there that handles TBI, like Absolutely. Mike said, give HMR a call. You won't regret that you did. And, and obviously they have some other great services as well, but can be really critical for your TBI cases. So Mike, thank you so much for being here. Connectionology, really appreciate your sponsor sponsorship. So thanks again. Hey, we enjoy it. And uh, thank you for having us. And, and I'm excited because we're going to see you guys in Nashville. Um, you're one of like our grand partners for that 
yes. the summer that we're doing. We're going to have a lot of fun. I'm very excited. I'm like counting the days. Um, it's yeah, just, it's just going to be my, it's just going to, it's just me today. I don't have any dogs with me. Usually sometimes you get an appearance by like a 145 pound Great Dane, but unfortunately it's just me today. Oh, right. Well, next time, please make sure they come. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. We'll see you soon. Don't forget to add your information to the chat box. For I sure will. Okay? Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. And now I'm so excited because we have Ingrid, um, who, guys, we love and adore her. She has been in the industry well over 30 years, and she's going to tell you- 40, 40, 40. 40? No. How is it 40 already? That's all what I, know, I said. All I know is you are amazing, and we're actually really excited because um, probably in about two weeks, you're going to be speaking with Eric Hertz and Jesse Van Sant again on another one of our Nursing Home Abuse webinars. So stay tuned for that date, everybody. And um, the Ingrid is just, she's incredible. And the team there at On Point, um, she's gonna tell you a little bit more about what they specialize in, but we really, really love working with that team. So Ingrid, tell us a little bit more about what you guys do. Thank you. Yeah, I just talked to Eric today. We're gonna be sort of doing a, a soup to nuts, uh, doing a, a, a nursing home case. I've had a couple of attorneys uh, ask, ask for that sort of a, a little mini boot camp. So he was very excited about that as am I. Um, so I'm a geriatric clinical nurse specialist, but I'm very interested to hear what Dr. Stein has to say, because for 10 years, I worked in critical care, all of them in trauma centers. And I took care, I worked in the surgical ICU and the neurological ICU, took care of a lot of victims of MVAs, um, many of whom weren't wearing seat belts and many of whom weren't wearing helmets with, with motorcycle accidents, but who certainly suffered major consequences that went on and on and on. I've worked with physiatrists um, and I think that you're hearing just what specialists they really are. Um, you know, he spoke to the anatomy uh, of a case and how folks go from acute care to rehab. Sometimes they go to a, an acute re rehab unit. And then from there, once they, uh, once they're done with that acute care of five hours a day, may go to something like a skilled nursing facility or vice versa, if they're too too old or damaged to be able to do that much acute rehab in a day, they'll go right to a skilled nursing facility for less intense uh, therapy until they've met their goals and then either go home or sometimes unfortunately into long-term care. But we have specialists across all of those, um, those types of facilities from physicians and geriatricians, um, um, to radiologists and, and surgeons and trauma specialists and uh, nurses that work with trauma patients or in the long-term care setting. I manage all of On Point's um, geriatric cases. We used to say just nursing home cases, but bad things happen to older adults and across the entire healthcare spectrum. So we've sort of changed it up to saying whether it's in a hospital or home care or um, hospice even or long-term care or SNF or assisted living or group homes, we do all of that. And my colleague, Dog Mantagno, ha handles all the other cases that will involve things like motor vehicle accidents and, and locating experts all over the country to review uh, for causation, et cetera. Um, we are good at explaining the medicine. Um, I know that Kim Embersall was on yesterday to speak to the fact with John Romano that we're very accessible. Um, all of our act, uh, experts are clinically active. I myself and Dawn are, are, are you know, long-term nurses, I used to say 30 years, but it's crept on me that it's 40 and can help explain the medicine. Um, so uh, we've gotten a lot out of these connectionology webinars. We, we love doing them and um, thanks for the opportunity and I will put my contact information up. Thanks. Thank Thanks so much, Ingrid, and thank you to On Point for being such a great sponsor. And you guys, they do these pain and suffering uh, reports that are incredible. I just had one done a couple weeks ago um, for a client who has a TBI and some other orthopedic injuries, and I was just blown away at how incredibly well done those reports are, and they can be extremely helpful uh, for your cases and mediation. So reach out to On Point. They can really bring a lot of uh, value to your case, and I would highly, highly recommend that you reach out to them. So Ingrid, again, thank you. We love you thank so you much here at uh, Connectionology. So uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. And then Ingrid, don't forget to put your information in the chat box too, okay? Um, thank you again so much to everybody for taking a moment just to listen to this. Great, great people. Um, now I'm so excited because I am going to hand it back over to Dr. Stein 
and we'll be able to open up your PowerPoint and pick right back up. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let me back up one. There we go. That's where we left off, I believe. So um, another uh, consideration, of course, is um, underlying uh, conditions. Uh, perhaps the individual uh, had uh, prior trauma uh, from, from which the individual has recovered. Um, there's a very frequently an exacerbation, which may be a temporary flare-up of a pre-existing medical, medical or uh, a condition related to trauma, um, or there may be an aggravation or a worsening of a pre-existing condition as the result of trauma. So uh, if an individual fails to improve uh, or to get back to their baseline um, as it relates to those pre-existing conditions, uh, then uh, we would say that uh, the individual has sustained an aggravation uh, of, uh, of a pre-existing condition uh, as the result of trauma. Um, so many injuries and conditions uh, can be overlooked, minimized, uh, or ignored. We, I alluded to some of them uh, early on in the presentation, um, and uh, they may be physical conditions, they may be psychological conditions, uh, and they may be symptoms uh, that... Um, that haven't been adequately explored. So for example, a mild traumatic brain injury um, can, uh, can, can result in, in symptoms that, um, that are easy, easy to overlook um, if one is not focused on them. Um, some attention problems, some mild irritability. Um, uh, similarly for post-concussion syndrome, um, um, it's, it's easy to kind of gloss over them. Uh, they're not as easy uh, to quantify. Uh, you can't take a picture of them. Um, so uh, they sometimes get, get lost in the shuffle. However, um, they may significantly impact uh, the individual's quality of life. So it's important um, to, uh, to delve into them and to really tease out what symptoms the individual may be having uh, as the result of these overlooked injuries. Um, these <clears throat> are somewhat less easy to overlook. Um, peripheral nerve injuries, uh, such as a brachial plexus injury, um, a median nerve injury, a peroneal nerve injury, uh, and of course, uh, something that, that can be absolutely catastrophic is a complex regional pain syndrome. Um, so again, not as easily overlooked, uh, but unless you actually do the tests, um, first of all, tease them out um, based on the history, on the interview of, of the individual uh, or the patient, um, and then do the appropriate tests to quantify them, uh, they can be missed. Uh, complex regional pain syndrome is, is a very unfortunate one because uh, that may come back to haunt the patient years later. Um, it may not be readily obvious um, early on in the development of the, of the patient's uh, care and development of their symptoms as the result of an injury. Um, it may become obvious only much later um, in the individual's course. So it's important to keep in mind the potential for the development of complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, or perhaps there were um, uh, uh, segments of the spine uh, that were completely overlooked, that had never even been uh, evaluated, uh, particularly if it was uh, the kind of injury that did not require um, hospitalization. Um, there are um, areas of the spine that may have been completely overlooked because they kind of take a back seat um, in terms of the patient's presentation. Uh, if a patient comes in complaining of 
very profound symptoms involving the neck or the lower back and only milder symptoms involving the thoracic spine or the pelvis, um, it's, it's, it's not difficult uh, to, to overlook those injuries. Shoulder injuries, um, you know, all the time, um, whether it's uh, because the individual is bracing themselves um, against the dashboard or the steering wheel uh, or what have you. Um, these, uh, the shoulder is a relatively unstable joint to begin with. Um, and so forces across the shoulder joint can easily result um, in injuries that again, unless specifically looked for, um, one can overlook. Um, you know, a shoulder, shoulder pain can present very non-catastrophically um, and, um, and, not, and, and not necessarily get a lot of attention. Uh, but with a careful examination um, and the right imaging studies, um, it can uh, become much more obvious and it's uh, possible uh, to, uh, to quantify the nature um, of, the, uh, of the injury sustained at the shoulder joint. Uh, similarly for the hip and, and similarly for the knee. So we have to, the point being here is that um, when a patient um, or an individual, as the case may be, um, has subtle findings um, or not as catastrophic as their chief complaints, um, it's, it's very important um, to delve into these and see exactly what's there. Uh, because to gloss over them is to do the individual a disservice. Um, you know, this, this um, slide speaks to soft tissue injuries and it includes fibromyalgia, um, but actually it really, it goes way beyond this. Um, there are a number of, of, it, of illnesses that <clears throat> the conventional wisdom is that they can be precipitated by trauma. For example, um, uh, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune diseases in general, uh, they may lay dormant, um, particularly uh, if a patient has a predisposition to autoimmune diseases, um, if there's a family history of autoimmune diseases. Um, these diseases uh, may typically um, remain latent until they are precipitated by some kind of catastrophic uh, injury or perhaps even non-catastrophic. Uh, and I have seen this a number of times uh, in my career uh, and uh, undisputed. And then uh, in terms of the, uh, the psychological impact, uh, these are some of the, uh, the entities that uh, individuals who have been involved in trauma uh, obviously can, can suffer from, whether as a direct result or, or as the result of consequences uh, that impact the individual's uh, lives. So if an individual um, has lost control over, uh, over their life in, in, in the sense of perhaps they, they no longer can live independently. Perhaps they have to rely on family members um, to, um, to keep their affairs in order. Uh, this can um, engender quite a bit of anxiety and depression um, uh, um, on the part of the individual. Uh, losing um, the ability to, uh, uh, to care for oneself, whether it be physically or whether it be financially, um, loss of control in general. Um, is, uh, is a big problem for individuals that have had uh, injuries and, uh, and for whom they, ne they now have to rely on others uh, for assistance uh, can typically result in anxiety and depression, um, even not as a, as a direct re uh, result of the injury, but, but as a subsequent complication. Um, so disability speak to what is it that the individual uh, can no longer do uh, that they used to be able to do, uh, whether it's personal self-care activities of daily living, dressing, grooming, hygiene, getting in and out of bed, on and off the toilet, 
um, all of those things. Um, is, there a, a, is there an activity that the individual can no longer complete independently or need uh, additional time to complete uh, uh, because, of, uh, because of the impairments that they have? Impairment speaks to um, a tissue or an organ or an organ system that is no longer functioning properly as the result of an injury or an illness. A disability is what results, uh, is the way it impacts the patient's uh, life um, as the result of being unable to complete certain tasks, whether they be personal uh, tasks, whether they be social tasks, um, being able to, um, to participate in, in social organizations, uh, being able to socialize, uh, being able uh, to be in, uh, in environments uh, that, that they previously had no problem uh, being in, but, uh, but now because of their impairments, perhaps to their central nervous system, they can no longer be in, uh, in environments where there are crowds, where there's noise, uh, where they don't have full control over their movement. Um, so this is another type of disability. And then uh, obviously um, uh, the way it's more uh, traditionally thought of is occupationally. What is the individual uh, no longer able to do occupationally that they uh, had been able to do prior to the injury? So um, Connor, do, do you, uh, Connor, do, would you like to, to jump in on, on this slide? I'm sorry for not giving you uh, advanced notice, but. This is a, a little bit more of, uh, of the PR piece of physician life care planning presentation. So uh, if you're okay with it, I'll, I'll hand this slide off to you. Yeah, Dr. Stein, I, you know, we went over this uh, a bit in the beginning, but uh, a little bit more about physician life care planning. You know, I said this before, we're the nation's leading provider of damage, damages valuation services in the United States. And our mission is to be the world's highest quality provider of damages valuation services. And uh, this is a little outdated, but we do now have over 80 life care planning MDs who are board certified in physical medicine and re rehabilitation throughout the country. And we pr produce affordable, high quality damages valuations with a lead time of uh, six to eight weeks. Thank you. And I'd like to, to point out on a personal note that uh, there is no tag in the South Florida area. Uh, and that's another uh, indication that this uh, that this slide is a little bit outdated because I am in the South Florida area myself. So let's put a little, a little tag on that South Florida region as well. Next, next time we, uh, we do this presentation. Um, so a physician life care planner um, has the capacity to provide valid and independent medical opinions and conclusions. Um, and Obviously, this is something that I do all the time. I actually uh, do pick up things that, um, that the individual had not been diagnosed with um, by his treating physicians. Um, but as the result of reviewing the medical records and as the result of performing an interview uh, and examination on the individual, uh, if something um, uh, occurs to me as being a relevant diagnosis to the injury, um, I have no problem including it in my central opinions and my diagnostic conditions, uh, as well as in future medical requirements. Um, so that's something that, that, that definitely does happen. Um, as physicians, we obviously have the clinical background uh, to understand the significance of the objective findings uh, and the, the, the symptoms. Um, as I mentioned, we perform uh, interviews and examinations on these individuals. Um, it's, it it um, is so valuable um, from a, an evaluation perspective uh, to lay eyes and, and hands uh, on the individual. Um, it, it, it's really, um, it's priceless, you know, in terms of the value that, that, it, that it adds to, uh, to our ability to, um, uh, to really delve into the nature and extent of the injuries that the individual has and the impact that those injuries have uh, on the individual. I, I, I can't uh, uh, stress this enough. 
Um, and then of course we have established life care, uh, life care planning standards um, that uh, the American Academy of Physician Life Care Planners um, uh, has, um, has put forth and which we, uh, which we adhere to. So we have a scientific method. We have a methodology uh, that you'll see a little bit about in the upcoming slides that, that we adhere to. Um, so uh, they're, they're really beyond, uh, beyond reproach. So the purpose of a life care plan, um, our approach to, to life care planning is to uh, accomplish the clinical objective of life care planning and to answer the basic questions of life care planning, which uh, we'll, uh, we'll come up with right now. So the objectives of life care planning, to diminish or eliminate physical and psychological pain and suffering, uh, to uh, help the individual reach and maintain their highest level of function, given the individual's unique circumstances, to prevent complications, um, whether they be physical uh, or mental, uh, that the individual is, uh, uh, is predisposed to as the result of the injuries that they sustain, and to uh, help the individual achieve the best possible quality of life in light of their conditions. And these, by the way, are the same clinical objectives that we employ when taking care of patients, whether in the acute inpatient rehab unit, uh, where I spend a lot of my time, or, or in the outpatient setting as well. And the basic questions of life care planning is, what is the uh, individual's diagnostic condition, or more often, uh, what are their diagnostic conditions, plural? What medically related goods and services does the subject's diagnostic conditions require uh, in order to achieve those, uh, those uh, to achieve the objectives that we spoke about in the previous slide, and how much will the medically related services uh, cost over time? So um, what we try to, to do is, is avoid the problem of not uh, substantiating the medical opinions and quantitating the, the conclusions uh, that we come to. Uh, these are, are common failures. Um, and our process, um, which is uh, very uh, meth meth um, uh, methodical, um, allows us to avoid uh, these pitfalls. And the methodology is this, uh, the basic sequence of the, uh, of the future uh, plan formulation. Uh, the objective findings uh, lead us to diagnostic conclusions um, and consequent circumstances, uh, which allow us to um, project what the individual's future medical requirements will be um, and, uh, and how much are those future medical requirements going to cost. Um, it's applicable to catastrophic cases, um, as you see on this slide. Um, and equally um, applicable to non-catastrophic cases. Um, and by the way, I can interject at this point that, uh, that just recently, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the life care uh, planning, um, I don't like to call it an industry, but the life care planning uh, space um, has come up with uh, definitions for uh, catastrophic versus non-catastrophic. Um, and the way we look at it now is that um, any injury that uh, either now or in the future is likely to impact um, an individual's ability to perform specifically self-care activities of daily living. So we're not talking about housekeeping, we're not talking about shopping, cooking, cleaning, but uh, self-care activities of daily living, dressing, grooming, hygiene, uh, feeding, uh, in and out of bed, on and off the toilet, walking, um, any injury that, uh, that negatively impacts the individual's ability to um, complete those tasks um, is, uh, is considered to be a catastrophic um, um, injury. Um, some more um, cases, uh, types of cases uh, that our me uh, uh, methodology 
works very well with um, all across the board. So um, the, the proper context for formulating uh, this, uh, uh, this life care plan, what are the future medical requirements going to be? Uh, what medically related goods and services will, uh, will the individual require as the result of, uh, of his or her injury? Um, so we're always going back to these, uh, to these same uh, objectives. And these are what we keep in mind when we, uh, when we formulate our uh, future medical requirements. Uh, future medical requirements um, in our process are broken down into these uh, different categories. And they include uh, from the beginning, acute care services, physician services, diagnostics, medications, laboratory services, rehab services, uh, equipment and supplies, nursing and attendant care, and environmental modifications and transportation. And again, this is all uh, very uh, methodical. Um, so we have a start date, we have a quantity, we have uh, a frequency and a duration and, uh, and a unit cost. Uh, so it becomes uh, fairly easy uh, to, to cost out uh, what any what any uh, service uh, will, will, uh, will cost um, uh, uh, for the duration of care. Um, personal injury, economic damages, uh, valuation model. Uh, so we start with a physician authored life care plan. Um, we uh, look at medical damages, loss of earnings, loss of household services. Um, all of this um, is included in our life care plan. Uh, it's all in there. Uh, and that actually concludes my presentation. Uh, I'll turn it over to Connor if he has any uh, additional um, comments. Thank you, Dr. Sai. I think we're gonna get started pretty soon with uh, some question and answers. I know there were a couple, couple in here so far. Uh, the first one, I saw, let me just see if I can pull it up again, it was from Chris. He asked about, uh, what about sideswipe injuries? What injuries are related to a motor vehicle accident maybe being sideswiped? So uh, again, obviously depending on uh, the intensity of the impact, um, but um, if the impact itself is not so severe as to cause um, injuries, what frequently will happen um, is that an individual may lose uh, control of their car um, and then subsequently be involved uh, in either um, a motor vehicle collision with another uh, vehicle or, um, or a single, uh, a single uh, car, a, sing a single vehicle uh, collision. Um, if the side swipe is severe enough, such that the individual gets shaken up, then all of those non-catastrophic um, injuries that we spoke about earlier um, can result from that type of, uh, of an accident. Thank you. And, then, and Chris had another question. Uh, I actually, I wrote it down, I think it was on slide 18, there was a graphic and he's asking if it was a left or right shoulder. I don't know if you're able to pull up slide 18 quickly to answer that for him. Let me see what I can do. Slide 18. Okay, so we are looking at the right shoulder here. Okay, that's the right shoulder. I also, I have a question for you. Sure. In relation to this presentation, uh, you know, overlooked injuries with motor vehicle accidents, how would you know, uh, you know, as a doctor yourself, when a life care plan would make sense? So, um, I, I think uh, the best way to, to think about that is, um, is this individual going to require um, care in the future in order to achieve the clinical objectives that we spoke about? earlier to prevent complications, 
to uh, decrease pain and suffering, um, to, to help the, the individual achieve the best possible quality of life. So if we're talking about somebody um, where you're even thinking about those questions, uh, in other words, we're not speaking about somebody that had an injury, um, recovered, and obviously, you know, now no longer needs uh, medical care. But if an individual uh, needs medical care, ongoing medical care, uh, then I think uh, it's reasonable um, and and probably in the in the individual's best interest uh, to to get a life care plan. Thank you. Perfect. And what I'm going to do is give everybody a few more minutes. If you have any last minute questions to pop in, that would be great. But I'm going to bring in Ted with HMR, who's going to quickly do our coffee giveaway. I'm so excited about that. And then in the meantime, I wanted to just remind everybody that I am going to send this to you so you can stay in touch with Dr. Stein, stay in touch with Connor. Um, if you'd like to reach Dr. Stein, just go ahead and send Connor an email and he'll get you guys connected. And as well as if you'd like a copy of today's slides and also stay tuned for my email because I'll have some great handouts that I'm going to include um, for you. That'll be really um, educational for you guys. So stay tuned and stay in touch with our amazing partners at HMR and On Point Legal Nurse Consulting. Um, and again, don't forget, I've got lots of brand new webinars coming up. Very excited about those. So stay tuned. Probably tomorrow I'll start adding some of them. So be on the lookout. And then I think we've got Ted with us right now. Hi, Ted. Hey there. How you doing? All right. We've been on the edge of our seats. We want to know who is winning the coffee. And it's four bags of freshly roasted Peruvian coffee. So if you can, um, please do the honors. Yes. And it's this is uh, Ethiopian coffee. Peruvian was... Oh, that's right. About a year ago, we were yeah doing Peruvian and then went to Ethiopia. Ethiopian is my favorite, so uh, I just love the uh, love the, the the flavor of it. Nice. Um, and it is uh, Karen McIntyre out of Phoenix, Arizona, is our big winner today. So congratulations! Yay! Congratulations, Karen. I tell you, it always gets me so excited because nobody knows who's going to win, and she's probably sitting there like, no, there's no way I could win, but. You did, you won today and we're so happy for you. And don't forget, um, if you didn't win today, Ted, there's gonna be many more chances, right? Yeah, I was trying to think, I don't know if we've had an Arizona winner in the past. So I was just looking at like, hey, Arizona is pretty cool. Oh yeah. And we've got people winning from all over the country. Um, there's probably been what, two or three that have actually won twice. So yeah. it's just a matter of getting lucky, I guess. But um, anyway, Karen, both Ted and I will reach out to you after this webinar. And thank you again so much for your support. Um, Ted, thank you for everything you do over HMR. You guys are amazing and we're so happy we get to work with you. Well, it's wonderful working with y'all as well, so. All right, thank you. we'll see you soon. And then now, unless there's any more questions um, or comments, I was gonna just say thank you so much to Dr. Stein for being with us today. And big thanks to Connor for helping us get all of this organized. Um, but we really appreciate everything that you guys do over there at Physician Life Care Planning as well. And um, do you have any last minute things you'd like to add? Yes. I, I, again, Dr. Stein, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to give this presentation. Um, I have received some emails already from uh, some people attending. I will send over this PowerPoint presentation. Um, also, you'll get an email following this, uh, the wrap up here with a a life care plan by Dr. Stein that is related to a motor vehicle accident. So you guys can see kind of the whole big picture, the whole plan, how everything uh, everything comes out. So that, that will be following this presentation in an email. Fantastic. And Dr. Stein? Um, well, just to say that um, my perspective on this is somewhat unique um, because I, um, in addition to, uh, to my role here at Mercy Hospital, I actually sit on the trauma committee of NYU Langone Long Island Hospital. Um, so I, I wish I I wish I could share with with the audience um, what that process is like. Uh, perhaps that's something we 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 might want to look at in the future. Um, trauma committee um, and the care of the trauma patient in the acute care hospital is so fascinating, and there's so much to it. So much goes into it. Um, 
that at some point, uh, I think it might be worthwhile, um, you know, sharing sharing that as well, because when you when you know what happens to the individual when they first sustain the trauma and come into the hospital, it gives you such a different perspective on what the individual um, has gone through. Um, so it, it's 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 a good perspective uh, to at least have some insight into. Looks like we're going to have probably a part two then. Is that right? <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate your time today. You are incredible. Thank you for all the work that you do for your patients, for the hospital, and for everybody who's watching, all of our attorneys. Like, we just really value your time. So thank oh, you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And for the great work that you all do. Absolutely. And Haley, you're amazing. Come back. I know I'm going to see you soon. Um, Connor, thank you for again for today and for everybody watching. I hope you have a wonderful remainder of the week and uh, we'll be in touch. Keep a lookout for my email in just a moment. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks so Thanks much. Everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.